Hello, everyone. Ladislas Maurice here from the wanderinginvestor.com. So today I'm really excited to be discussing with John Palomny. John, how are you? Good. How are you? Good, good. So John is from Mighty Texas. He's been working in energy for many years and we'll be discussing his views on two commodities that he thinks are worth looking into, namely uranium and oil. But before we get started, John, can you tell us a bit about your background, please? Uh, well, I've basically been working in the energy industry in different sectors for over 30 years. Uh, currently, I work in the renewable industry, building renewable plants, uh, but I've worked in coal plants, natural gas, nuclear, just about everything that's has to do with uh, electricity or power production I've done too. So I have a, a big interest in energy because I believe that it, um, it underpins every act other activity that we do. Working in energy is one thing and investing in energy is another. Um, so what made you transit from not only just working, but also investing in the space? Cause it's, it's quite different. So um, energy, investing in energy specifically, uh, the focus I have mostly is in oil and gas and coal or fuel sources. Um, they're extractive industries, so they're cyclical industries, and they're typically longer term, um, not very good businesses, but there are instances within the sick cycle where they, uh, because of lack of investment, the investment prospects become very lucrative and um, it's basically supply and demand uh, dynamics. And when supply uh, is being overwhelmed by demand, prices goes up and that provides opportunities in these time windows of like 18 months to three years where you can make a tremendous amount of money. So um, I have, it was my invest in, investment thesis looking for, industry, I'm a contrarian and I look for contrarian type situations and uh, areas that are bombed out, but that have a catalyst for a re-rating or a change. And uh, right now, energy, I believe is, uh, well, for the last six months, at least, uh, that's really been uh, my main thesis for, uh, for uh, undervalued and contrarian uh, area of investing. So I've been following you on Twitter and on YouTube. You have your own channel. I'm always very interested in, in your content. People see me as this guy that invests a lot in real estate in emerging markets and in stock markets and frontier markets, which I do, but I also invest in more conventional markets, if, if I can put it this way. I also have trading accounts and trade in New York and Canada and in Australia. And so energy is something that I personally have been investing quite substantially in over the past year, year and a half. And you've been coming up with quite a, quite a lot of content on uranium. Could you outline your thesis for uranium? Yeah, the quick uh, elevator pitch is uh, uranium um, represents uh, about 11% of the world's electricity production, 20% of the electricity production in the United States. Um, it's base load capacity. Uh, obviously, the fuel for uh, reactors is uranium, and uranium had a massive bull market from about 2003, 2004 to 2007, early 2008, where it basically went from about 20 bucks to about $140. Um, subsequent to that, uh, it, uh, the price collapsed because it went kind of uh, parabolic. Um, you throw in the Fukushima nuclear disaster uh, in Japan. I believe that was in 2011. And uh, it really put a wet blanket on the industry. Um, this is a classic example of an extractive industry, uh, you know, going into disfavor and basically getting blown out. I mean, at the top of the market in 2007, you had over 500 listed uranium companies. Um, so How many now, were there in, in 2003? Maybe two or three that I remember. <laughs> So okay. basically, that's one of the that that just as a side note, that's one of the indicators when you're near the top when all of the promoters in Vancouver and on Bay Street in Toronto start uh, producing uranium companies in mass 
they have a saying in those places when the ducks quack feed them so that'll be an indicator but anyways that's kind of a side note but uh back to the uranium thesis basically you're in a situation where the price to extract uranium is for most producers probably 45 50 60 dollars a pound and it's selling for 28 dollars a pound on the spot market uh, i don't know probably a little bit higher in term contracts and that's not a sustainable way to do business selling something for basically half what you produce it for so what you have is you have a contraction in supply over time you work off the previous excess from the previous investment cycle and so what you're basically doing right now is living off uh, you have an industry that's in liquidation you have basically no uranium production in north america currently all the mines are closed you have one of the major producers cameco for example is um that has some production with partners uh, in kazakhstan but it's buying material in the spot market to fulfill its some of its uh, obligations you now have uh, Kaz Adamprom, who's probably the, you know, the, the 800 pound gorilla in the industry. It's buying material in the spot market now. So you basically go back to the old adage, you know, low prices cure low prices. These, this is a typical cyclical commodity business like all the rest. You have a price rise that draws in tons of capital. People create excess supply, and then that creates the dynamic for the eventual price decline and you have an oversupply the price comes down and then you have to work off that so that's what we've that's what we've been experiencing you throw in fukushima and um that really put a wet blanket on things but what's interesting is that um on the demand side uh demand for uh uranium fuel has been increasing why because uh, nuclear reactor construction around the world has actually been increasing. There's actually more reactors now operating in the world than there were before Fukushima. Why? Because it's basically the cleanest, safest, best uh, baseload power in the world. And um, people that have a rational uh, view towards their country's energy policy, like in the East, in uh, emerging markets, China, India, Russia, these places, they're building out their nuclear fleets. And uh, so you have a situation where you have increasing demand that's going to intersect with declining supply. Uh, what's interesting to note is that during the last bull market in, like I mentioned back in uh, between 2003 and 2007, there wasn't an actual deficit in the supply of uranium. What's interesting now is that depending on who you wanna to talk to or what analyst you want to uh, listen to, there's anywhere from a uh, 30 to 50 million pound deficit currently. Uh, so working down inventories, it's very opaque industry. Uh, it's very difficult to get real-time information. Most of the deals that are done between utilities and producers are have NDAs. They don't like to advertise what they're doing. So a lot of people focus on the spot market. That's a very uh, low volume market. So that's really not the right place to look. But uh, I look at market action and let the market tell me what it's doing. And you've had a tremendous big run in uranium equities. And that would indicate to me that um, the market's forecasting or anticipating um, rising uranium prices in the future. And I think it's one of those things where you can't really know where, when it's going to, the price is going to start moving higher for uranium, but you know it's eventually going to happen. I mean, Rick Rule, who's a famous investor in Canada, most people are probably familiar with that invest in junior stocks. I mean, he makes these interesting quips, but this is what he, I mean, either the price of uranium goes up or the lights go out. It's that simple. I mean, you can't, uh, the United States produces virtually none of its own uranium to power its reactors, yet it has 20% of its grid powered by, powered by nuclear and, uh, you know, the previous administration started a big push to fix that problem because it's a national security issue. We have a nuclear Navy fleet, plus we have this huge electricity baseload fleet that we're relying on places like Kazakhstan and Russia for, for our supply. And that's probably not a good uh, geopolitical way to think of things. And the Biden administration has indicated that as part of its ESG uh, views, it has a positive um, view towards uh, nuclear energy also. So you're seeing that around the world, you're seeing more and more influencers, Bill Gates, 
Um, Michael Burry just came out, the guy that was in the big short guy. A lot of people, uh, money people are now uh, saying that nuclear has to be part of the uh, decarbonization or green energy push. Tell us how you feel about that or your listeners feel that's kind of where the West is going. So you have a lot of tailwinds lining up behind this uh, uranium price. And it's one of those things where I, I feel like, um, you know, what are the downsides? If you had another nuclear accident like Fukushima, but other than that, uh, the demands there, it's growing. I mean, China just announced last week as part of its new five-year plan, they were basically going to increase their their nuclear fleet from about 50 gigawatts to 70 gigawatts in the next four years. So they're ramping up. It, it, you have a lot of tailwinds. That's, uh, I think it's, um, it's probably, and it's such a small market that when these things move, the market cap for the entire, you could conceivably, theoretically buy the entire, entire uranium mining industry for about 10, $12 billion. That's just ridiculous. So at the peak of the last cycle, uh, the market cap was about 150 billion for the, for the, for the industry. So you're saying that it's still not too late for people to get into the game? Absolutely not. I mean, if you want to have an analogy about, you know, I mean, think of a baseball game, you're probably in the top of the first inning. So what happens a lot, I think, is people see the initial blast off the bottom. I mean, you're talking about like generational lows. You've had this tremendous move or some of the companies have moved 100, 200% or more. And people think, oh, I missed it. So what people should do, I think, uh, is, um, you know, understand the long-term fundamentals and understand that, you know, in these commodity cycles, what can happen, I'm not suggesting this could have, would happen, but I mean, you can obviously make a case for $80 a pound over the next couple of years. Uh, and there's a chance, uh, depending on uh, what happens, if uh, hedge funds get involved again, start buying material, and speculative uh, money starts coming in. I mean, there's no reason why you couldn't get over $100, $100 a pound in the next three, three to five years. So uh, that kind of movement in the, in the price of, of the material would, I mean, you're talking about, you're going to see some 10 and 20 baggers in there somewhere. So it's very speculative market. I would say that you have to be very uh, uh, careful in what companies you put your money into. But uh, I think there's tremendous, it's like Doug Casey says, uh, when a uranium bull market gets going, it's like trying to put the contents behind F Hoover Dam through a drinking straw. It's just, you know, there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of room to put, uh, I mean, big money into this market. And so when money does come in, it, it moves very quickly. I, a friend of mine introduced me to the, to the uranium thesis. So I, I had a look at it and, and the more I dug into the thesis and the more I saw how mathematical it is. And apart from really a nuclear accident of some sort, I can't really see too many risks involved. Is there anything else that you, you see that people should be aware of? Apart from, from an investing point of view, the volatility, um, buying the wrong companies, and just for the space as a whole, an accident. Any, are there any other negatives? Um, not that I can really see. I mean, the bottom line is, is that if you look at the BP, um, energy annual review, I mean, the amount of the numbers are so large of where energy demand is going and nuclear really has the only option for some of these countries. I mean, you can look, I encourage people to look up, uh, on Google images, just type in Chinese city pollution and you'll just see these pictures of this, you know, that's not fog you're looking at, that's particulate matter in the air from all the emissions from the vehicles and from the coal burning that's going on. So these other countries, we don't have a choice, they're choking on their own development in many cases. Um, you're well-traveled, I am also, you've been to some of these countries. Um, in some places, what you see on TV sometimes is very, you know, oh, modern, they have skyscraper, these shopping centers and central business district, but then you go into the industrial areas and it's a uh, kind of Victorian. So I think with the, with respect to the downside, that's one of the things I try to look at, but I don't see any, unless you have a massive like Chernobyl or, or something like that, or Fukushima, I don't see much downside. Some people will ask me, well, what about thorium? What about fusion? I mean, okay, well, what about interstellar tr 
star travel. I mean, all these things are possible, but they're not in the context of the next three to five years that are going to disrupt the industry. So then there's no substitute. That's something in commodity markets, people need to be cognizant of resource markets. There's no substitution effect here because in a nuclear reactor, uranium is the fuel. There is no other substitute. And, and to your point, it's very important for people to understand that if they get involved in uranium, they need to have an exit strategy because it's not, you're not buying a blue chip company. You can just buy and then you, you keep it till retirement. You're going to have to exit at some point because uranium is extremely cyclical. Um, so it'll hopefully go up a lot, but then you need to get out at some point. So you need to actively monitor the market and be active out there to, to understand what's happening. So let's talk about, I mean, you're from Texas. Let's talk about oil. You're the, you're the expert. You're probably born in a bathtub of oil. So um, the oil industry is very interesting. Um, uh, I have this kind of love-hate relationship with oil and gas. I mean, I really like the industry. I worked in the industry for a while. Um, I've invested in actual oil wells, uh, much to my <laughs> regret. But uh, anyways, uh, it's another cyclical industry, right? And basically, my thesis, the elevator pitch on this is very simple. Um, everybody, we were kind of in a recovery mode last year. Well, let's go back. Let's rewind the, the clock. So the world uses 100 million before COVID, 100 million barrels a day of petroleum. Um, that's a lot of petroleum. That's 32, 34 billion barrels of oil a year. For the last decade, at least, um, we have not found 34 billion barrels to replace the barrels that we have uh, been extracting from the earth. Now, that uh, hasn't been a problem because we were living off reserves that had been found previously. So I had always been looking at that and saying this reserve life, you know, um, is in decline around the world. It's an extractive industry. Like people have this view that you can drive by one of these little oil wells with the pump jack and, you know, you invest in that and it's putting out a hundred barrels of oil forever, like in some like, you know, civilization video game or something. It's not like that. I mean, these things go through a life cycle where they initially produce it's a bell curve and then they go into decline until the resource is extracted and then it's exhausted. So that applies to an individual well, obviously an oil field and countries. And it's another cyclical industry. So you had this phenomenon with the shale, shale industry, everybody's familiar with, where basically um, the shale boom, if you will, that was in my view financed by very low interest rates, basically sucked all the oxygen and investment out of the rest of the industry. I mean, that was where I mean, you went from basically the U.S. went from about five or six million barrels of production and within, you know, seven or eight years went to 13 million barrels. And that really kind of um, obscured, in my view, kind of what was going on in the overall industry. And so then you last year, for, you throw in, for example, um, what happened with COVID. You had this huge demand shock where demand was crushed uh, because of all the lockdowns. And so demand probably dropped. I don't know, 10 or 15 million barrels a day at the worst. But that showed, I was shocked that it didn't go down more because that shows you, I mean, if you drop to 90 million barrels or 85 million barrels a day of use, that's how inculcated oil is in everything we do. It's not just a transportation fuel. It's used in so many other things that we don't have time to get into, but everything around you in your home, everything that you're wearing, everything is, has a hydrocarbon component. And so, um, now that we're coming out of this COVID situation, we're, we're, we're re-engaging, uh, we're opening up. Um, we haven't done any investment for years in non-OPEC investment into reserves and production. Shale has really got bashed in the head and it's not gonna come back for a while. I mean, it's uh, with all that investment, 300, $400 billion that was borrowed I mean, virtually none of those companies made any money or had any positive cash flow. So that is not going to be uh, 
you know, coming back to its previous glory is my view. And so you have this lack of investment with the rest of- what, Why not? I mean, if these companies all go bankrupt, isn't new capital going to come in with uh, low interest rates and say, let's give it a shot again? Well, I mean, how many times are you going to do this? I mean, I mean, if you're, there are, there are properties, there are companies that make money, but I mean, they've done this twice now. They, you know, the original uh, capital investments, the chase for yield with junk bonds. I mean, all these companies, are, a lot of these companies are going bankrupt now. There are companies that are well run like EOG and uh, Oxy has some good properties, but most of the properties that were developed during the boom were the prime tier, low hanging fruit with the low cost, high production rates. Now you're into, you know, secondary, less lucrative uh, properties. So the price goes, the cost goes up. And yes, there will always be, you know, if oil goes, you know, you're seeing it already. Oil's at uh, today, Brent was hit 70 on the attack in Saudi. Uh, so you're up, you know, you're up massively. So rig count is starting to climb. There are always going to be speculators or it's always going to be risk takers and wildcatters. But do I think we would go back to the level we were at before? Not, not necessarily. Now, if oil goes to $100 a barrel, $120 a barrel, who knows what will happen. But remember, I mean, you've turned off all these rigs. You've mothballed all this equipment. It's sitting in yards. Uh, the crews that were working on the frat crews and on their drilling rigs, they've all dispersed. They went into other industries. So even if you wanted to ramp things up, it would take, you know, it would take some time. And so that's why I think this is, again, this is not, this is a burning match also, like you talked about uranium stocks. This isn't a buy and hold thing either. This is a situation where you've had, you're catching a cycle where it's been underinvested in and yet demand's coming back now. And I think it's going to come back massively. Uh, don't, because a lot of people will tell you, well, don't the Gulf countries have a lot of spare capacity? Uh, that's true. Uh, they have capacity, but they don't have a lot of spare capacity. Um, if you, uh, that's one of the, in my view, misnomers. Um, and then they also talk about Iran and all these things. So I would suggest that uh, the spare capacity is probably less than people anticipate. Um, and you have to remember that uh, you're dealing with Saudi Arabia, who is a country that basically has several very large oil fields like Guahar that's over 50 years old. Um, and yes, they can turn the taps on for some short period of time, but you have to be very careful uh, running these older oil fields that you don't uh, push them too hard. I mean, there's a lot of what they call, they pump water into these fields now to uh, keep the pressures up, push the oil. And if you, if you do that too aggressively, you can damage um, the, uh, the reservoir. It's interesting about Saudi Arabia. Um, I remember back in the old peak oil days when Matt Simmons wrote his book, Twilight in the Desert, and he's talking about Saudi Arabia. If you look at Saudi Arabia's published oil reserves, they've always been like 250 billion barrels. I mean, when I was a kid, it was 250 billion barrels. Last year, it was 200. I mean, it's like, does this never go down? So what are the, what's the real capacity in, uh, uh, in Saudi uh, to really expand their production or Kuwait or, you know, and then you get into some of these tertiary countries or other countries, second tier countries like Iraq. Iraq has tremendous amount of reserves and uh, its production has been growing, but I mean, who wants to invest there? I mean, I, I, I wouldn't, I mean, maybe Kurdistan, uh, then you have Iran um, and, you know, it has spare capacity, it sneaks barrels on, but uh, it's not, I, you, you can see in the news lately that uh, the Biden administration and the EU haven't been really super flex to really lift the sanctions. So I would suggest there's a window of opportunity here as this demand comes back, as the world opens up over the next year to 18 months, that you could get a, a price spike in oil. Um, and I think it's going to surprise people just because I think with all the pent up demand, um, I was looking at, for, for example, um, this is just anecdotes, but like if you try to book like flights this summer or late spring, or early summer, like on Lufthansa or some of these other places, I mean, a lot of these airlines are already booked up. Um, a lot of the um, people want to go on vacation. People want to get out of their house. People want to travel to Greece, Cyprus. People want to here want to go to Jamaica or Hawaii, Cancun. They want to, they want to travel. They want to move around. So um, I suggest that there's going to be quite a bit of um, uh, pent up demand that comes back. And I also think that, you know, let's not forget that as the rest of the world opens up in the emerging markets, 
you know, we're going to ex probably exceed that 100 million uh, barrels in demand uh, in the next year or so. And I think it's going to surprise to the upside. So I think there's a window of opportunity for higher oil prices. Obviously, if prices get high enough, enough capital will come in on any commodity market and they'll find the reserves. They'll bring them uh, on and you'll see a, uh, a decrease in price. Because we're already at $70 a barrel right now. Isn't capital going to start coming in now? Yes, but uh, like I said, there's kind of a window. And then let's throw this into the mix. Look at all of your, with the exception of maybe your national oil companies or the Russian oil companies, all of the oil companies in the West, at least the majors, have, are disavowing their industry. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you have BP now into its second time now in the last 20 years of getting into green energy. Um, Shell, the same way. Total just had a, a Bloomberg article on last week where BP and Total bid on some offshore leases in the North Sea, I believe, and they paid twice the amount that everybody else did. So this is, are they going to be inclined to, um, you know, defend their, I mean, it's just not, it's, it's not politically palatable to be an advocate for oil and gas or invest. You have banks divesting, uh, won't make loans to oil companies because of ESG mandates. You have pension funds, endowments, uh, family offices, disavowing energy, selling energy. Um, it's uh, the, the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund is selling off its energy, and yet the Sovereign Wealth Fund was built with oil and gas revenue. So uh, this is a certain zeitgeist that seems to be fashionable now, and uh, we'll see if that remains the case when gas is gasoline's four four fifty a gallon. I suggest it probably won't be, but uh, that's a whole nother discussion. It's probably not appropriate for this uh, venue. But um, yeah, I think there's a window of opportunity for higher oil prices. And I don't think that the industry is going to be able to react in, in you know, these are long lead time projects. Also, you can't just flip a switch uh, and, and do that. So I think all those things come together to, to uh, make a, a higher price inevitable over the next 18 months. Do I think the oil price is ahead of itself right now? Yes. I mean, I was forecasting by the end of the year, maybe $70 a barrel. You've already hit that. So we're probably due for a pullback, but um, I think longer term, you could still see 80. And if you look at OPEC, I mean, a lot of their budgets, and even Russia, just break even oil price for most of those budgets are, you know, for OPEC, the average is $95. Saudi's about 80 and Russia's about 70 in the 70s. So they're not going to be opposed to seeing an oil price at, you know, $75, $80 a barrel. And I don't think consuming nations they wouldn't love it, but it wouldn't be detrimental to their economy. So that might be an equilibrium price that they would be OPEC would be shooting for. Okay, but I'm not. A, I don't want. I'm not a macroeconomist economist on the oil industry. I mean, I'm just looking at, you know, uh, what I think is a trading opportunity in a okay. cyclical industry. So you see uranium as a three to five year play, and you see oil as an eighteen month to two year play. Yeah, I'd say so. Yes. Okay. Great. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much for all this insight, John. Where can people follow you? Um, I'm pretty active on Twitter, just at John Polamy. Um, I have a YouTube channel, just go on a YouTube search and put my name in, John Polamy. I make a weekly video um, about the markets, uh, what I'm seeing around these themes. Sometimes I'll throw a bone out there and give a, a name or two. Uh, and I also have a, a newsletter, um, actionable intelligence alert newsletter, where I uh, suggest uh, different companies that uh, can take advantage of some of these things that we've been talking about. And uh, that's, that's available for people too. But I think uh, Twitter and YouTube are probably the best places. I also have a, a blog, but I, I, I'm, I'm trying to post more there. That's actionableintelligencealert.com. Okay, great. Fantastic. All the links to these are below in the description. John, thank you very much for your time and insights. Really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Cheers.